Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this episode of Quick Care Bites, where we interview experts in the field to distill clinical polls and wisdom around critical care topics. My name is Jem and I'm an intensive care trainee and I'll be your host today. In this last episode about ARDS, uh, we'll be discussing a few interesting controversies, uh, namely the role of neuromuscular blockade, steroids, and fluid therapy considerations in ARDS. So once again, we have Dr. Jason Poir today. So um, beginning with uh, the role of looking at neuromuscular blockade, um, pathophysiologically, how does neuromuscular blockade actually help in the treatment of ARDS? The main reason why neuromuscular blockade may help, uh, and I emphasize the word main uh, mm. as I was speaking in uh, the year 2022, uh, is that it reduces ventilator-induced lung injury. Okay. So patients who are huffing and puffing away despite uh, recent doses of sedation and mm. analgesia, uh, they can uh, breach the six mils per kg um, guideline for tidal volume. They can breach the 30 cm H2O guideline for the toe pressure. Mm. They can uh, also have ventilator induced lung injury of all forms. Uh, they can have flow starvation. They can have ineffective trigger. They can have double triggering. All of the above uh, can worsen volume induced, uh, ventilator induced lung injury. And ventilator induced lung injury has been associated with uh, worse outcomes, including mortality. So that's the mm -hmm. hypothesis neuromuscular blockade. When we allow the patient, the ventilator to take over uh, and not have the patient uh, contribute to his own worsening uh, outcome, mm -hmm. can improve uh, outcomes in the ideas. Okay. Can. Thanks, Dr. Jason. Um, so, while there's this putative possible benefits, are there any risks with neuromuscular blockade agents? Generally, worldwide, uh, some of the commonly used uh, agents are cis atracurium and mm. atracurium. Yeah. So these, these agents, they are eliminated by something known as Hoffman degradation. Uh, what this means practically is that they are not really cleared by kidneys nor liver. So in a okay. lot of patients with ARDS with multi-organ failure, it's fine. You can use them. They don't accumulate. So they are relatively safe. Uh, mm. c cetracurium has an advantage, uh, theoretical or otherwise, uh, over atracurium. And it is that it causes less histamine release and okay. therefore less hypotension. So mm. atracurium can potentially cause a little bit more hypotension than mm. cis-atracurium. Okay. But I think the most important risk with neuromuscular blocker is ICU-acquired weakness. Mm. Uh, there are studies that have uh, shown associations with it. And it makes sense, right? Uh, you paralyze a patient for 24, 48 hours. And after that, there is more weakness uh, as a result of multiple factors, one of which is neuromuscular blockage. Okay, thank you. So considering the possible benefits and some of these uh, possible drawbacks, um, how do we rationalize the use of uh, neuromuscular blockade in ARDS, both in terms of what the evidence says as well as practically uh, when managing a patient? The two most uh, quoted studies for neuromuscular blockade are an older one known as the Acuricis study and a newer one new, known as the Rose study. Yep. The older one, the Acuricis study, suggested that uh, because they recruited patients with ARDS uh, with a PF ratio of less than 150, suggested that cis if given for the first couple of days, can reduce mortality. Mm. Um, the interesting thing is that the newer study, the Rose study, also looked at the threshold of PF ratio of 150, mm. but this time around, it did not uh, show any improvement in mortality. Yeah. Well, many years have passed between the two studies, and when you scrutinize the methodology, there are differences uh, in the mm. way, for example, they uh, had the control arm ventilated, uh, different 
PEEP strategies, different sedation strategies, uh, meaning sedation in a control arm who are not on neuromuscular blockade. Yeah. So because of this, uh, in 2022, and that's what I said right at the start, uh, mm -hmm. neuromuscular blockade should not be something that we think of as first line. We should okay. consider them in patients with moderate to severe ARDS mm -hmm. that have a PF ratio of 150, which also means that these patients, they should already be in a prone position. Mm -hmm. Because if not, and prone position has a stronger evidence, if not, we shouldn't mm -hmm. be thinking about neuromuscular blockade. So okay. PF ratio of less than 150 is something that will make us think about it. Mm -hmm. But there needs to be other factors. They should not be routinely used. These other factors would include, especially, number one, patient ventilator asynchrony. And this is patient ventilator asynchrony, despite us trying our best to tweak the ventilator to reduce the asynchrony and to adjust the sedation and analgesia for the patient's comfort. That would be the mm -hmm. most important indication in moderate ARDS with patient ventilator asynchrony. Now, there are a few other indications that we should consider. And mm -hmm. one would be that despite limiting tidal volumes, so we said six mils per kg, sometimes the plateau pressure is beyond 30 cmh 2 despite a low tidal volume of six mils per kg. And we are forced to reduce the tidal volume to 5.5, 5, 4.5, 5, 4. mm -hmm. even 4 to achieve a low plateau pressure to protect the lungs. In these circumstances, uh, it would be reasonable to think about neuromuscular blockade to just take over control completely to try to protect mm -hmm. the patient. Okay. The last category I would think of is patients who are heading in the ECMO direction. So mm -hmm. we are talking PF ratio, of less than 80. And we know nowadays, uh, based on the Eolia and the Caesar study, that when you have a PF ratio of less than 80 for six hours, that will be time to consider uh, ECMO for mm. appropriate patients. And I think that that would for sure be time to consider also neuromuscular blockade. Okay, thank you. Um, so maybe looking at some of the practical considerations when we administer neuromuscular blockade for patients, uh, I think you did briefly talk about the choice of agents in terms of atracurium, cis atracurium, uh, but do we ever use other agents like let's say rocuronium? Uh, and when we give uh, neuromuscular blockade, do we give it like as a bolus and then see how the patient responds or do we give it as a continuous infusion and how do you decide how, how long to, to give it for and um, how do we go about monitoring patients in this context? Yeah, as I said just now, uh, worldwide, uh, because of uh, local practices and also because of the accuracy and the role studies, cis mm -hmm. is the most commonly used agent, yep. especially in developed mm -hmm. countries. But there are cost concerns and that's why many of us, including at, uh, us, we use mm -hmm. atricurium. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, Many of the neuromuscular blockers, including rocuronium, are, are reasonable. Uh, mm. But the newer ones with less uh, ability to cause hypotension, less dependent mm. on clearance by the kidneys, uh, by the yeah. liver, etc. Mm. Uh, bolus or continuous infusion, if you look at the latest version of the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines that just came out uh, not too long ago, mm. uh, the suggestion was bolus when necessary in uh, uh, doses mm. as opposed to continuous infusion and and this is a recognition of the fact that actually the the side effects of neuromuscular blockade are not trivial i see acquired weakness mm. and balance that against the evidence that is not terribly strong in a role study of benefits mm. so if your main issue is intermittent patient ventilator asynchrony give a bolus give a bolus of cisatracurin give a bolus of atracurin and consider bolusing again if it happens. For how long? Okay. Usually, the protection against ventilator-induced lung injury, the harm from ventilator-induced lung injury are especially uh, important 
in the earlier phases of mechanical ventilation. So usually 24 to 48 hours. After that, um, we should really think about stopping uh, the neuromuscular blockade. Monitoring, mm -hmm. we use if we do, because some centers do not, but if we do want to monitor uh, the, the, the efficacy of the neuromuscular blockade, we do what's known as the train of thought. So basically, we put uh, pads uh, in the face or on mm. arms, mm. and we then give electrical signals uh, four times in a row yep. to try to cause muscle twitching. Mm. And if we overuse our neuromuscular blockade, even though we have given four pulses of electrical signals, there's zero muscular twitch. And that's known as a train mm. of thought of zero. If we underuse our neuromuscular blockade, even though we, we give four, and then we think that the patient is uh, on neuromuscular blockade, we still see four twitches. So mm. generally, we go for two out of the mm. four twitches, and we adjust the dose according to, to that. Um, okay. Is it absolutely necessary? Uh, some would argue actually no, because some would argue that you just give the continuous infusion at the lowest possible dose. And mm -hmm. as long as there's no uh, obvious patient metadata asynchrony, the plateau pressures are okay. There's no need to, to check the train of form. Some would also mm -hmm. argue, and this makes perfect sense, that if we are just giving bolus doses, why would we want to check uh, train of form? Because it's just mm -hmm. bolus doses. Look at the patient ventilator asynchrony no more, and we just wait. So uh, okay. monitoring is a plus minus thing. Mm. I, and I'm talking here about train of form, which is monitoring for neuromuscular blockade. There's yeah. also monitoring for depth of sedation because mm. the most evil thing you would want to do is to put a patient on a neuromuscular blockade and not adequately sedate the patient with mm. say proper form. You, you yeah. want the patient not to be aware that he or she cannot move, cannot breathe, right? Mm. So it is not easy to assess the depth of sedation once they are under neuromuscular yeah. blockade, uh, whether it's bolus or whether it's continuous. Mm -hmm. So easily when you start this uh, sedative agent such as propofol for patients on neuromuscular blockade, you want them as deeply sedated as they can be. Mm -hmm. uh, and once they are sedated and you have started the neuromuscular blockade, you have lost all means of accessing their sedation. And so some ICUs, including ours, would then use uh, the bispectral uh, index or the BIS mm -hmm. monitoring, uh, yeah. which basically is a EEG number that tells us about the depth of sedation. And the lower the number and there's some targets, the better, mm -hmm. uh, more convinced you are that the patient is adequately sedated. Okay, got it. Thanks, Dr. Jason. Um, so now maybe shifting gears a bit. Um, let's talk about uh, steroids and uh, ARDS. So, I mean, um, the COVID pandemic has seen, uh, I guess, a resurgence of the use in steroids in ARDS, but perhaps out of the context of uh, COVID ARDS, um, do we give steroids? And if so, um, when and what kind of steroids do we give? Yeah, so uh, thanks to our uh, colleagues, especially in the United Kingdom, the main studies for steroids, and there are many, but the main ones would be the recovery trial which suggested that in patients with critical ARDS, uh, sorry, critical COVID, uh, meaning patients who are mechanically ventilated, uh, there is strong evidence that giving steroids would reduce mortality. The flip side of the study, and I know this is an ICU podcast, but the flip side of the study is that if the patients are not even on oxygen, then there is no evidence. In fact, there is suggestion that giving corticosteroids will harm the patients. Mm -hmm. And then there are patients in between. They are not mechanically ventilated, uh, mm -hmm. but they are on some form of oxygen, whether it's uh, invasive or non-invasive. There's also some evidence that uh, corticosteroids will work. So to summarize, um, the evidence suggests that in COVID-19, as long as you're hypoxemic and require oxygen, we should give corticosteroids. Mm. Um, what steroids? Many different ones available. 
there is some suggestion that things like uh, dexamethasone, metalpenicillin may better uh, penetrate the lungs. Mm. Uh, the evidence is not terribly strong. And so often what steroids we use are just based on what steroids were proven to work in which study. Okay. And most of us would therefore use the recovery steroid, which is dexamethasone, which is six milligrams once a day mm. uh, for up to 10 days. Yeah. But this um, is the COVID. Should I talk about yeah. non-COVID? Yeah, perhaps non-COVID also. Like, I guess there were a couple of studies and um, yeah, maybe out of COVID, um, is there a role for steroids? Yeah, the struggle we have for non-COVID is actually the fact that ARDS is but a syndrome. It's a mm. syndrome of many heterogeneous conditions. You're yeah. talking about things that range from sepsis from pneumonia mm. to polytrauma. Yeah. And yet we lump them all and we assume that they will re respond similarly. Mm. Uh, in the real world, it is not the case. Uh, yeah. How are we to know that one single drug can improve or make a patient worse in the same way for multiple mm. conditions labeled under one umbrella. Yeah. So the benefit mm. of COVID is that we know this ARDS is due to the SARS-CoV-2. Mm. And we know that steroids work. Mm. The disadvantage of syndrome pre-COVID is that we don't know. And so investigators have been struggling for years to prove that corticosteroids work. Mm. The two mm. most widely quoted studies are older studies by Umberto Maduri, which use methylprednisolone in early ARDS yeah. within a few days. And there is a winning regime of methylprednisolone of up to 28 days that suggests mm. an improvement in outcomes. Mm. Having yep. said that, there are also many studies that do not, and there are many studies that have been meta-analyzed, and there are different outcomes shown by different meta-analysis. Mm. It is very likely that corticosteroids can improve oxygenation in non-COVID ARDS. What we are not absolutely clear is whether corticosteroids can improve survival. The second mm. study, uh, there is a lot more reason. Uh, is the Dexter ARDS study, and this is non-COVID. And the regime used is 20 milligrams of dexamethasone for five days, followed by 10 milligrams of dexamethasone for five days. Okay. So higher than the COVID doses, but the same mm -hmm. drug. And this multi-centered study, which was published in the Lancet, found an improvement in mortality for mm -hmm. ARDS, even though it's a diverse heterogeneous uh, umbrella. Okay. And so, uh, personally, I do use dexamethasone even in non-COVID ARDS purely because of uh, what we found in the DEXA ARDS study. Mm. And, and in all ARDS patients or in certain subgroups or certain severity uh, types? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, of course. Uh, only in patients with at least moderate to severe ARDS. Okay. And you give it early on in the course. Of we give it early on, yes. Mm -hmm. There's a bit okay. of a complication here because many of them are also in septic shock. Mm. And uh, because of how studies have been performed, as well as some uh, PKPD issues, these mm. patients are often given uh, hydrocortisone. Right? Yep. So uh, a very, very typical dose is 50 milligrams, six hourly. Mm. Uh, in patients with... Uh, shock requiring basal presses. Uh, for example, when the norepinephrine dose is more than 0 0.25 micrograms per kg per minute, and this is based on the latest surviving sepsis campaign yeah. guidelines. And so mm -hmm. the complicating factor is these patients have both septic shock requiring high doses mm -hmm. of norepinephrine, and you can consider hydrocortisone, as well mm -hmm. as moderate to severe ARDS, and you can consider dexamethasone. Um, okay. Personally, purely because of own comfort, purely because there are a bit more studies and the guidelines suggest the 
short uh, hydrocortisone more. Personally, mm -hmm. if there is both, I give hydrocortisone. Okay, got it. But if it is just pure ARDS, yes, I give mm -hmm. dexamethasone and I start early. Okay, thanks, Dr. Jason. And finally, to our last question, um, we're going to talk a bit about uh, the fluid strategy in ARDS. Um, there's been some talk about whether we should be liberal or conservative. There's talks about how um, excessive fluids may um, worsen uh, ARDS. And there's talks about de-resuscitation in the context of managing of a, management of an acutely ill patient. So how do we navigate this space of a fluid strategy in a patient with ARDS? Yeah, so I, I think one... A few words that is useful to remember in intensive care is less is more. Okay. So if we have to be inclined towards one of the two words there, we should be inclined towards conservative. Mm. And uh, there is common sense reasoning and there is also uh, evidence-based reasoning. The common sense reasoning is that you already have a patient with ARDS with problems with uh, epithelial and endothelial dysfunction, the alveolar capillary basement membrane is being destroyed. There is edema. And the last thing you want to do is to contribute more to the edema, the shun, the loss of lung compliance, the cytokine release mm. and by giving fluids and causing a lot of leakage. Uh, that can potentially be disastrous. So if you can choose one of the two words, you will choose conservative. Uh, yeah. What does that actually mean in real life? That actually means in real life, if you have to give fluid because you suspect hypovolemia, mm. then be as targeted as you can. Uh, mm. I quote the recent study that's not for ARDS, but it's for patients with sepsis and shock. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine just a few months ago. And this is the classic study. Mm. And, and what the study did was randomize patients to liberal or conservative. And when they talk about liberal, it's just giving fluids the way we usually give. Mm. Talking about pyramids, pyramids or crystalloids, etc. When we talk about conservative, it's actually waiting for relatively severe markers of hypoperfusion and hypovolemia before you give fluids. Mm. You're talking a high lactate of more than four, four for example. You're talking a terrible oliuria, uh, such as less than 0 0.1 mu per kg per hour. Uh, mm. You are talking terrible blood pressure, sometimes despite being on vasopressors, uh, MAP, mean arterial pressure of less than 50. You are talking mm terrible mottling and hypoperfusion of the skin below the knees. And this, or you're talking clear fluid losses, ongoing like diarrhea. These five things that I just mentioned are the triggers for giving fluids in the conservative arm. Without these triggers, the conservative arm would not give fluids. Okay. But with the outcomes, no difference. No mm -hmm. difference in mortality, no difference in intubation rate. Is it disappointing? Maybe because we would have hoped that being conservative, we would see some improvement in outcomes. But no, we yeah. did not see. There's a caveat to that study. The caveat to that study is that many patients, even before randomization, had gotten their 30 mL per kg of crystalloids for sepsis. And so the yeah. randomization happened after that. So it's not as yeah. conservative as you would want it to be to prove your point. Yeah. But to me, when we interpret this study, another way of interpreting it is that since conservative is at least equivalent and not worse than liberal, why mm. do I need to give more? If yeah. I give less, potentially, especially because the patients in that study were not primarily selected for ARDS, and we're talking about mm. ARDS, all the more I have the comfort of knowing that I do not need to give so much. So okay. um, if I summarize again, I have a patient with ARDS. There's some reason I want to consider fluids such as hypovolemia. I have to be very careful based on the indications, for example, in the classic study that I just mentioned, 
Mm. I have to be very careful in the fluids that I give, the crystalloids, the 250, the 500 mils. I have to be very careful to decide whether the patient did or did not respond to the fluids based on cardiac output monitors or ultrasound mm. uh, or the leg raise test. And I have to be ready to stop giving fluids as soon as possible. There okay. are studies from the past, from the ARDS network called the FACT study, F-A-C-T-T, -T, where conservative uh, fluids, keeping the patient dry, are associated with better oxygenation. So mm -hmm. yes, keep the patient as dry as possible. And once they have gotten past the very, very hemodynamically unstable state, I do, we do a volume assessment. Mm. And if we think that somehow we have contributed to hypervolemia with the fluids that we have given, uh, then it is time to, as you said, think about the de-resuscitation phase, which yeah. means that we have to pull out our diuretics mm. and diuresis and diuresis. And we're talking maybe a negative balance of uh, 1 to 1.5 liters a day until we think that the patients are new volumic. Okay. Thanks so much, Dr. Jason. I think it's been a very helpful uh, session discussing some of these uh, controversies around uh, steroid therapy, the role of neuromuscular blockade, as well as fluid strategies. So uh, once again, thanks so much, Dr. Jason. Thanks. Thanks, Samir, again.